Hello and welcome to Series Capades. My name is Chuck and in this episode we're going to talk about common pests and diseases affecting our plants. Before we begin, like many things in life, prevention is a lot better than cure but unfortunately we're not always blessed with foresight so here we are talking about pests and diseases. I can never stress the importance of this point enough. There's nothing better than having a good cultural practices in your garden. That is having a clean environment, keeping the weeds down, and growing plants in optimal growing environments. This is something that I should be doing with my plants but I have been very lazy about it. The first point here is quarantine. When bringing home new plants, make sure to quarantine them, keep them away for, from your existing garden, maybe up to a month, it depends on the plant. And the idea behind this is that this waiting period, this quarantine period allows you to check on the plant, gives you enough time to see if it is infested with something, infected with something, and it allows you to react accordingly. Because for, for instance, if you see pests or fungus in it, at least you haven't introduced it to other plants yet and you are able to treat it independently from your plants. Keep your garden clean, make sure not to use or reuse foreign potting mix just willy-nilly. Make sure that you have checked it properly, check it thoroughly. Use the quarantine period to check if the soil is clean enough. I think the easiest option here is to remove all of the soil from your new plant and use your existing soil mix that you have in your garden, then place it in quarantine. And as for that soil that you just removed, you could leave it somewhere under the sun, let it dry, let it burn under the heat of the sun. This might cleanse it, this would kill any harmful, you know, harmful things that might be in the soil. And you might be able to reuse it in a few days. And depending on how your plant reacts, you might be able to move it out of quarantine pretty soon. Because at least it's using the same potting mix as your other plants already. Quarantining is something I don't always do, mainly because I'm very disorganized but it is something that I would like to consciously do in the future again as for the soil you could leave it out to the Sun exposed to the UV this would sterilize and kill any harmful stuff in it heat and UV would sterilize it with the least effort on your part now that that's out of the way let us talk about the main meat of this topic the main meat of this episode and that would be the common pests and diseases affecting our plants we generally have to worry about a few things that would be harmful insects harmful fungi, burns, and maybe viruses. And for the most part, it's mostly going to be the first two. Burns, not so much. Viruses, there's little you can do about that anyway. So we will be spending a lot of this episode talking about the first two things. There are three common ways how insects would interact with the plant. First of which is when they are sucking or tapping into the sap, into the plant stem, to the plant stream. I'm not sure what to call it. I was thinking bloodstream, but no, the plants have no blood. The second way they interact with plants is when they eat or ingest parts of the plant. So this is very familiar. And the third would be feeding on the nectar. The third one would be very familiar. Of course, this would be the pollinators such as the bees, the beneficial insects. I mentioned these three because you have to keep this in mind. This would help you differentiate between effectiveness of different methods. And depending on each insect, all you have to do is to determine which method an insect uses and you can match it with the appropriate pesticide. Before we go into the details, I'd like to lay down some ground rules, some best practices if you will. Best practices when handling pesticides. The first of which would be, of course, wear protective clothing if needed because some of them could irritate our skin, our eyes, they could get into wherever. And this caution is even more important when it's windy outside. Generally, try to avoid windy days, but if you can't, then make sure you are upstream. That way, when you spray, the droplets would be flying away from you rather than into you. And depending on the toxicity of chemicals, you might want to use protective covering. In my case, I usually just start with my long sleeve shirt and you know, I just spray far away. That way I don't have to wear a mask. But in other cases, I would have to protect my eyes and my nose as well. I could do this, but 
in worst cases and more with more toxic cases i'll have to definitely use a face mask or something the next step would be to spray early in the morning or late really late in the afternoon that way you avoid midday midday is where the pollinators are most active and you would not want to affect them so avoid the window of the midday and spray really early or really late in my case i would go for the really late because i'm not an early riser another thing you could do before a treatment is to use a spray of water just to get rid of some of the pests that might be easier than you know picking them off manually but that depends on what type of pest you are fighting with because you, you wouldn't want them to fly over to the next plant or go into the ground where they could hide and reproduce so case to case what was that when doing this spray make sure not to use oil or alcohol based fluids because they would leave marks on the plant and they might burn either from the sun or chemical burns there's also this possibility that they would interact with the farina which is the waxy coating of the leaves which protect the, which serves as a sunscreen protecting them from the sun this oils or alcohol might rub them off might remove them and make them more susceptible to sunburn so if necessary if you're not sure how it would react you could just test with a small section of the plant and see how it goes then from there decide whether you would want to continue using it or use something else there are so many insecticides available in the market they differ but they are generally grouped into classes so i would be focusing on these classes rather than each specific brand especially since we are all from all around the world a lot of the brands that i have here won't might not be available in your area and stuff in your area might not be available in my market so let's just go with classes and active ingredients so the first class of pesticides that i would like to discuss would be oils in australia you would see them come in many brands such as eco oil pest oil neem oil whatever they are all basically the same in that they have the same effect they are all natural they are all organic in that they are derived from plants or stuff that it's naturally occurring in nature the way they work is that they either smother or drown the insects the smothering effect happens when the when an insect tries to feed or bite or ingest the plant and there's an oil coating in it basically what happens is that the oil gets clogged in their proboscis what was it whatever they use to eat or to suck the sap to get stuck it would get lodged in that small tube that they use and they would not be able to breathe Basically, it will suffocate them and they would die. Apart from that, the effects can vary depending on the active ingredient. For instance, I looked up neem oil and the active ingredient is azadiractin. I think I said it right. Apart from the smothering effect, it reduces their feeding, you know, the, the appetite, I guess. Maybe it makes it harder for them to feed. It also reduces their egg laying capabilities and it acts as a repellent. Other oils may be based on petroleum oil and it has a similar effect in that it smothers and drowns them it also reduces their tendency to feed or lay eggs so this is why i just bunched them under the class of oils because they have they basically have the same because they basically have the same effect the same mechanisms the way it works is that you need to apply a thin layer of oil to coat the entire leaf so it is a spot treatment and you'll have to replenish it as soon as the layer starts getting thin usually depends on the product maybe a few months or a few weeks I don't know you'll have to consult the usage directions on the label as with most spot treatments the timing is very crucial here you'll have to target it you'll have to apply it when the, the levels the numbers of pests are starting to get over acceptable levels or when there are new growth on the plants the key here is to maintain a good enough coverage that you're able to reduce or put a dent in the spread of the pests in the garden oils tend to be more effective on hard scale insects not so much on soft scale insects and soft scale insects include mealy bugs so you might want to use something else for them being natural oils are not toxic to humans and animals and since they have to be ingested in order to work this does not affect the pollinators because it does not get into the nectar so it's perfectly safe to use around the garden with flowers where the bees are just avoid spraying directly on the flowers the next class of pesticides would be the pyrethrines and the pyrethroids they are basically they basically have the same effect the only difference between the two is that pyrethrines naturally occur in nature or at least they were harvested from nature while pyrethroids are synthetic man-made but essentially as far as effect goes 
they are the same thing. They are very toxic to insects. They target the nervous system of the insects who touch or eat it. The way it works is that it excites or overstimulates the nervous system, which in turn leads to paralysis and even death. It is generally non-toxic or has very low toxicity with humans, but it can be irritating for some when applied to the skin, when exposed to the skin. So make sure to wear some protective covering if needed. Apart from irritation, it could also cause numbing or tingling effect on contact. So, you know, better to be safe if you're unsure how it would react with your body. Pyrethrins and pyrethroids do not leave residues, so it's perfectly safe to use as spot treatment, especially on leaves under the sun, so spray away. If you read the labels, you'll often see this combined with piperonyl butoxide or PBO. PBO is a synergist. By itself, it does nothing, but what it does is it increases the effectiveness of the pyrethroids, pyrethrins, because normally insects produce enzymes that help combat insecticides by making them break down faster. And what PBO does is it blocks those enzymes, preventing them from breaking down the insecticides. That way, the insects would be exposed to the pyrethroids much longer. Another active ingredient you might see in the label would be the tau fluvalinate. It is classified as a pyrethroid or a synthetic pyrethrin, but I think it deserves a special mention because it is registered for several uses, one of which would be for food such as beehives and honey. I think they're using it to control other insects. Other uses include ornaments, container gardens, greenhouses, landscapes, dip for cuttings, for building surfaces or perimeters, controlling ant mounds, and certain crops grown for seed. So it has a lot of uses. But the problem is with tau fluvalinate, they are very toxic to aquatic organisms. So you have to be very careful not to use this when it's going to rain because it might seep to the water table or if you live near water bodies such as lakes or the ocean, then you know you might want to limit it. The next class of pesticides would be soap salts. The proper name for this would be potassium salts of fatty acids, whatever that means. <laughs> so these things are used as insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, and even algicides. So as the name suggests, according to research, it is produced by adding potassium hydroxide to fatty acids that are contained in animals and plants. And as such, it is generally recognized as safe by the FDA and are used as multipurpose food additives. The way it works is that it targets the cell membranes of these insects and disrupts it. And what happens is the, content, the contents leak out. This results in the insect dehydrating and dying. This is more effective on soft-bodied insects such as the mealybugs, aphids, thrips, I guess, and what have you. Insects that fly or adult insects with hard outer coverings such as lady beetles would be less susceptible to this but it might still affect them so you have to be careful of where you're applying them that way you won't have to that way you won't affect the beneficial insects as well it might be a bit toxic to plants especially the plants with the hairy leaves because this means that uh, this salt fatty acid salt solution would be sticking more on the plants longer and since this is a bit oily would not evaporate as easy and it would stay longer the interaction between the salt and the plant might cause burns either chemical burn or maybe burning from the sun so you have to be careful about doing this do if you have to use salts make sure to do it when it's not too hot outside I guess but best consult the label because I haven't used soap salts yet so check the label again in humans very large doses can cause stomach upset vomiting you know stuff like that and like usual soaps it might also cause irritation in the eyes and maybe skin it depends from person to person but as long as one uses the recommended dose then you'll be fine it is also safe for birds and fish and whatever because these are found in nature and it is fatty acids are part of their natural diet it is safe or maybe slightly toxic to fish but it is very highly toxic to aquatic invertebrates because i guess they have they are set up to have a similar structure as insects so be careful be careful around those make sure there's no runoff the next class would be systemic pesticides and there's only one active ingredient in my list that i've found in my research so far and it would be the imidacloprid which is better known in australia under the brand of confidor dun, dun, dun. it is systemic which means that applying it to one part of the plant makes it spread throughout the plant through the stem the leaves the fruit the roots wherever it goes everywhere and the way it works is that it targets the nervous system making it stop working the way it should so on insects it leads to paralysis and even death and as a systemic 
there might be a possibility that it can go into the nectar which is why when using products such as these you would want to remove all of the flower stalks that way insects that are attracted to nectar would not ever have a reason to get near the plant it is much more toxic to insects less so on humans but still there have been cases of irritation so make sure to use protective covering and wash your hands properly the good thing about this is it does not get through the skin easily but it can easily cross the stomach lining when ingested so you'll have to be careful about covering your nose and mouth that way you don't breathe or eat anything that happens to have uh, traces of ibidacloprid once ingested though it takes about 24 hours before it gets broken down and expelled from the body so it doesn't stay too long thankfully and it has no evidence of causing cancer it can last many months or years in the soil but can it gets broken down by sunlight very easily so like the recommendation i made at the very beginning if you're going to apply systemic pesticides apply it at the end of the day that way it gives the plant the time to absorb it overnight and the next day when the sun is out any excess would be quickly burnt out and broken down so there would be no traces of that chemical on the leaves you know everything would be inside already it is not very toxic to birds maybe slightly toxic to fish but it is very toxic to insects such as honeybees so be very very careful about handling this the role of imidacloprid in colony collapse the bees it's not yet very clear there are still ongoing ongoing research about it and i'm very keen on knowing what the results would be but until then i'm going to be staying on the safe side and you know remove all of the flower stalks before i apply any imidacloprid however as we wait the large retailers the large suppliers in australia have started pulling it out from the shelves it's no longer available in retail and you could only see it online these days which i guess is for the best that way you would prevent it from being the easy access of people who do not or would not know how to use it properly but yeah you just have to be very careful another class of pesticide would be the mechanical type and a very good example of this would be the diatomaceous earth the diatomaceous earth is naturally occurring this made out of fossilized remains of tiny aquatic creatures called diatoms their bodies are made of silica and the earth's crust is composed of 26 percent silica by weight so there's a lot to go around it is not toxic and it does not have to be ingested to work because like i said it is a mechanical method of pesticide the way it works is that it gets into the openings of the the creatures of the insect shells or the joints or wherever wherever it can get through and this results in them absorbing the oils and the fats from the insect making them dehydrate and even die and as sand they are very abrasive and the more an insect struggles the more it gets in between their bodies you know it is no wonder anakin hates sand it goes everywhere in humans like regular sand it can cause irritation and swelling if it goes into your nose or your nasal pathway so you have to be careful with handling diatomaceous earth maybe you have to wear a mask especially if it's windy outside or you know they just fly around when you when you're not careful with your handling make sure to use food grade diatomaceous earth because that is considered generally safe by the fda and food grade de differs from regular de in that they have a, an extra extra step of purification they are sterilized there are many other active ingredients but i have just highlighted the main classes the main delivery methods the main ways that they work i could provide you with further reading if you follow the link in the description because i did a bit of research about all of the almost all of the commercially available pesticides in the market here in australia i took a look at all of their active ingredients and made a research on what each of them does for now i'll be putting it out as a list as a reading for you but in the future i might convert it into an episode into a video because there's a lot of information to go around now with all of those classes out of the way it's a good time to have a look at the different types of insects and see which class would be perfect for them let's go through them one by one for the next part here let's have a rapid fire let's look at each type of pest and disease and see which category they would fall into let's start with insects first up is scale scale sucks the sap of the plants which weakens them and makes them susceptible to other diseases they multiply rapidly laying so many eggs for treatment you could use their predators such as the predatory mites green lacewings small birds parasitic wasps 
maybe some lady beetles. Basically, just go higher up in the food chain, find their predator, and their numbers would go down. Most of these bugs, these predators, you could order online. They usually sell them in a packet or a box. You could definitely look at those options. Otherwise, for predatory mites in particular, you could attract them into your garden by using a lot more mulch, compost, or manures. Basically, make it more organic. In our case, we have a succulent garden, a rock garden, then maybe not, this might not be as effective. You might want to go with lady beetles instead. Another thing you could do is to drench them with a forceful jet of water. You know, just to push them out or to let them slide off, fall off. That might work, but be careful not to let them land into the rest of your garden because that means that they'll be just climbing back up into your other plants. So do it somewhere separate, maybe in your quarantine area. And you'll want to keep at it, maybe do it consecutively for the next three days. But that is just a spot treatment, which means that you are only able to remove the ones that you can see. It might not be, you might not be able to take care of those that you can't see. So it depends on the plant. This method would work on tiny plants or long plants, leggy plants, plants that you could carefully look under, you know? Another thing that you could do is to vacuum them out. <laughs> yeah, as in an actual vacuum cleaner, might, it might work. As for pesticides, you could use anything. You could use spot treatments, systemic treatments. I would personally prefer systemic because at least that takes care of those that you can't see. Even alcohol works too. Of course, with scales, you would have to prevent the ants from carrying them around because ants tend to farm the scale insects, spreading them to as many plants as they can. That way, they would be able to produce a lot more of the honeydew, which the ants like. Next up would be red spider mites. Like the scale insects, they also suck sap, which weakens the plants, rendering them more vulnerable to other diseases. Treatment, again, like scale, you could use the same things I just mentioned for scale. Drenching the plants also really work, and you know that there are red spider mites if there's lots of... Um, small webs which would be typically too small for regular spiders i'm pretty sure i have lots of red mites here lying around third would be mealybugs and this is one of the worst things that you would find in your garden but the thing is mealybugs are actually a form of the soft shelled scale so everything that works for scale would work for mealybugs as well one of the differences between scale and mealybugs which makes the mealybug very toxic to plants is that they release a toxic saliva which seriously damaged plants so you definitely have to remove them with scale and red spider mite i'm not as concerned but with mealybugs <clears throat> i have to get rid of them like the other two the same treatment would work but i personally would go just straight ahead for systemics i do not want to waste any time especially since they are very good at hiding another thing that you have to take note is mealybugs love the shade so giving the plant some ventilation and exposing it to sunlight that might be able to reduce or contain the spread. So it all goes back to proper garden hygiene, proper culture, clean your garden, man. They're really good at hiding at tight and obscure places, which is why I think spot treatment would be very tiring, a lot of effort, and essentially why I prefer using systemics. I don't think it's worth the effort, you know? And finally, another way to avoid mealybugs is simply to collect plants with milky sap or have furry leaves they hate that up next caterpillars i'm sure you're familiar with them they love to eat leaves fruits whatever leafy fleshy part of the plant especially the newer growth so you better hide off your leaf babies they're mostly active when it's dark but you could also find them during the day and depending on the species some of them would be so easy to spot while the others not so much but the telltale signs would be you just have to look for bite marks along the leaves they would have the largest bite marks as for treatment they're relatively easy to control they're large enough that you could pick them off manually you know, transfer them somewhere else if you don't want to kill them another thing you could do to prevent caterpillars from appearing in your garden is to cover your plants with a fine mesh that way butterflies would not be able to lay their eggs on the leaves otherwise resorting to pesticides spot treatment and systemic treatment would work as well i prefer using spot treatment on caterpillars because they're easy to spot anyway fungus gnats they love warm humid conditions and live in organic matter you likely see a lot of these in indoor plants lining the pots especially if you tend to keep the pot moist or overwatered you'll find them inside they have a very short lifespan of three days so the easiest way to deal with an outbreak is to just put the plant out in the open expose it to sunlight expose it to open air 
What happens is that the adults would dissipate, they would fly away. The eggs get burnt by the sun, by the heat, and the sun will sterilize the soil as well. Basically, you're disrupting their life cycle. But of course, if you're going to move them out into the sun, make sure to expose them to mild sun, maybe cloudy days or maybe just a few hours in the morning. Because them being indoor for quite a while means that they won't be able to take on intense heat. And while you're treating them, keep them away from water or if you must water them, use the wicking method as in you water them from below. That way you avoid having the top really wet, really moist, really humid because that's where they stay and lay their eggs. You might also be able to trap them using vinegar. They seem to be attracted to it. Uh, you could also use sticky traps but with sticky traps, be careful where you place them because little tiny birds are known to get stuck in it. So use sticky traps with caution. If you have to do it, maybe do it indoors or enclose it in a cage where birds will not be able to get into. So some birds get attracted to grubs in the ground or nectar on the flowers. So be really careful when handling sticky traps. Vine weevils, the bane of my plant's existence. These little buggers come out in dusk and feed on the plants overnight. They burrow in the soil around the roots and you would find their grubs in there as well. They're these tiny little bugs about the size of you know, the moon on my fingernail or as a piece of rice. They have hard shells, they're brown. They have this little uh, protrusion in the mouth. I think it's a proboscis. I can't remember what it's called. One peculiar thing about them is that they could sense vibrations in the air and in movement. So as a defense mechanism, they can feel something approaching or a sound, a loud sound. They would let go and drop from the plant. They would drop into the ground and they would lay, they would lay and pretend to be dead. That way any potential predator would leave them alone. But don't be fooled by that. From my experience, they only appear during the warmer months, particularly summer. So if you live in a temperate climate like I am, then you only really have to worry about them during summer. They disappear once it gets cooler, probably just hibernating, but they're gone. Manually picking them off at night works, but it is it can be tedious, especially if there's lots of lots of them in the garden. Sticky traps would work as well, but again, be careful in the placement. That way you won't affect the small birds. If your plants are in pots, you could move the pot somewhere in your quarantine area. Maybe shake it off and you will see them fall down. Or you could pick, pick them off manually. At least that way, you get to kill them yourself. Another really effective way to deal with these types of bugs would be using diatomaceous earth. Again, diatomaceous earth goes inside the shells, goes inside any opening, any joints, and this is really abrasive, so this would be really irritating for them and they would die from it. So I think my recommendation for this would be to use diatomaceous earth. Earwigs. Earwigs really love organic matter. Seeing a lot of this in your garden basically means that your garden is too organic, contains a lot of decaying, decomposing organic matter. What I'm saying is your garden is filthy. <laughs> what they do is they hide under the filth, under the detritus, the dead leaves during the day and go out at night to feed. Normally they would be feeding on the decomposing plants but they tend to get overzealous and start eating the rest of the plants. Seeing one or two of them is not really a cause of concern but seeing a lot of them come out at night then that means there's something wrong in your garden. Like vine weevils, you could do a spot treatment. You could just pick them out manually. You could use traps. You could use diatomaceous earth. But more importantly, I think in the case of earwigs, prevention is a lot better than cure. So make sure that your area, your garden is clear. Remove all of the dead leaves. Remove all of the detritus. Reduce the number, reduce the amount of decomposing organic matter in there. That way they won't be attracted to your garden in the first place. Millipedes. They are not usually a problem unless there's too many of them. The same thing as the earwigs. And like the earwigs, they are attracted to decomposing matter. So everything that I mentioned about earwigs would also apply to millipedes. In case of an out-of-control population, carbaryl is very effective, but only use it as a last resort. Aphids. Aphids are also quite common, and they feed on a variety of plants. They do drink from the sap as well, so while spot treatment would be effective for them, you could use oils or pyrethrum or whatever. I think it's just going to take a lot of effort to remove all of them. So again, I'm a, I'm a type of person who just goes directly for systemics. So in the case of aphids, I might go with a systemic solution right away. Just make sure to remove all of the flowers. But other spot-based, contact-based remedies would also work. The way I see aphids is that I think they're easy to spot, they're easy to remove. But there's so many of them that I don't know if I 
I would ever manage to get all of them because they, they multiply quite rapidly so if you leave just even a few of them they would just multiply back and cover the plant again so it's better if I just go systemic and eradicate all of them at once. Now for a bit of fungi, Fusarium. Fusarium thrives in warm temperatures so if you're in a cold climate this might not be a concern for you. It is a long-lived fungus that lives that stays in the soil indefinitely so so even long after you think that the outbreak is gone they're still there. Fusarium causes leaves to wilt, wither, and die so it's a terrible terrible thing to have. It affects the vascular tissues of plants causing dark streaks and it also causes root rot. Again, like I've been saying at the very beginning, this can be avoided by having a good garden hygiene. Make sure your tools are clean between use. Make sure to gather all of the plant debris and dispose of them properly. If the debris is infected, burn them. In worst cases, bleaching might be necessary to sterilize it. And with Fusarium, soil fungicides are ineffective. So once your plant has it, move them to quarantine, put them away from the other plants, clean your soil. Rhizoctonia. Rhizoctonia is a soil-borne fungus found naturally in soils. Infected stems would, would, would have a dry, shriveled, woody appearance. It forms cankers around the stem, restricting the movement of water and nutrients along the stem. You'll want to chop above it and replant, apply some fungicides. And in this case, you'll want to use soil fungicides to drench the plant, the plant itself and around the roots. Since it is soil-borne, make sure not to reuse the soil, discard the soil and gather a fresh fresh batch and as usual with fungus do not allow the plants to be staying wet for too long because that would just encourage the growth of more fungus leaf spots these are the round the circular dark spots thingies on the leaves mostly on the leaves this is really common in rows and you'll also see this in the leaves of echeverias these round spots are commonly caused by fungi but sometimes by bacteria these are very common in trees and like I said in rows, they are not usually deadly. You could just remove the infected um, you could just remove the infected parts, the infected leaves, and that would help prevent the spread of it. And of course, like any other fungus, make sure to prevent excess humidity, give it proper ventilation that way if it gets wet for any reason to dry up easily. And of course, just keep your plant healthy. Brown spots. These are little tiny spots that you would see all over the leaves particularly the top side. This is not a disease per se, it's just an unsightly thing. And this is mainly caused by an excess of fertilizers. So these brown spots that you see on the leaves are basically excess salts. And to deal with it, you could just flush them with water. It would wash them straight away. It's not really a problem per se, it's just the plant telling you you're giving too much fertilizer. And finally, sunburn. Of course with sunburn, it should be intuitive keep them away from direct sunlight immediately or give them filtered light. If the new growth isn't burnt, then it will survive. And just make sure to gradually introduce it to the sun. This episode has gone on for too long, so I'll be leaving them, leaving the rest of the information I have as footnotes. I'm going to place a link down below, a link to my website containing all of the research that I've done. And in the future, I'll be creating a follow-up episode discussing all of these other active ingredients. In the next episode, I'll be focusing on watering, touching a bit on the myths and misconceptions, as well as the mechanics of watering. This is going to be a follow-up to the collaboration I made with Sheila of Succulent Fame, and I think you should watch it. So, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Special thanks to all of my Patreon supporters, especially Oscarino, Judy Seal, Snap Kui, Gloria Ninotti, Camila Arvaez, Linda Leal, Gwen Ott, Q2, Jesse May, and Ronin Perez. Thank you so much. Without your help, a lot of this is not possible. You should also check out my website, seriscafes.com. I have a plant shop and seriscapedia section right there. I push updates once in a while, so make sure to check back from time to time. And finally, follow me on Instagram, that's at seriscapades. I post a photo of an Echeveria every single day under the hashtag daily Echeveria.